Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Why is there violence in the Bible? Why did the authors of Deuteronomy present parables of genocide? Why did the Gospel writers posit a story about tribal, religious, and political betrayals, acts of treason, and violent acts by the hand of God? Why do both Testaments deal with war, cruelty, violence, and the threat of God's wrath? The New Testament is not new in its content. It's the same old content directed at a new audience. The Bible is not a bunch of broken fragments from different writers patched together arbitrarily. This is a boring Orientalist theory invented by German colonial scholars that nobody who knows what they are talking about takes seriously anymore. J. E. P. Q. The last one is my favorite. If you can't find the source, there must be an all-powerful imaginary source called Q. It was such an excellent idea that Gene Roddenberry named an entire race of fictional narcissistic deities Q. Good job, biblical scholarship. You're so mystical. For heaven's sake, pick up a copy of Tadazi and catch up. As inconvenient as it is for westernized, that is to say, Hellenized Christians, Paul's teaching of grace, his repurposing of Roman gratia in submission to the teaching of the cross was a reapplication of Deuteronomy's literary wrath against Israel's sense of self-entitlement and self-importance a redirection of God's judgment against the latest monsters to invade and occupy Mesopotamia. Deuteronomy was something like a directed conversation held indirectly with all parties in which God himself warns everyone, beginning with Israel. The land belongs to me. I put you in, and I can take you out. The New Testament repeats this warning to a new audience. What is it that Paul said? What is it that he said? Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Where did I hear that before? Hmm. Oh yeah, Deuteronomy. This verse, or sign, is the novelty of the prophetic self-destruction of the temple and of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And its sign is clear. The emperor has no clothes. I wish, I wish Congress understood Deuteronomy. But how could they? Even Western scholars, let alone the clergy, don't get it. Yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. Where did I hear that? Where did I hear that? Not just in Isaiah, not just on the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ, but in Deuteronomy. Remember, the writers of the Torah who wrote under the pen name Moses were something akin to disillusioned and disaffected State Department employees. So why did scripture deal with violence head on? Placing all violence in the hands of the unseen and indepictable God? Let me count the ways for you, for all of you evolved and enlightened Westerners. The following are notable genocides and massacres committed by invaders against occupied populations, starting from the Mesopotamian era through the Greek and Roman periods. 
the conquest of Sumerian city-states by Sargon of Akkad, circa 2334 to 2279 BC. The destruction of Ur by the Elamites and Amorites, 2004 BC. The Gutian invasion and destruction of Akkad, 2150 BC. The destruction of Mari by Hammurabi, 1761 BC. The destruction of Babylon by the Hittites, 1595 BC. The Elamite conquest of Babylon, 1155 BC. The Assyrian destruction of Susa, 647 BC. The destruction of Babylon by the Assyrians, 689 BC. The Persian conquest of Elam, 540 BC. The destruction of Thebes, 335 BC. The siege of Tyre, 332 BC. The destruction of Carthage, 146 BC. The massacre of the Lusitanians, 150 BC. The Gaelic Wars, 58 to 50 BC. If you want to get a sense of the cruelty and horror of each of these events, Read Deuteronomy! Nothing changes under the sun. This week, I discuss Luke chapter 6, verse 38. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to episode 536 of the Bible as Literature podcast. There's this fad right now because of the cruelty and stupidity, <laughs> the inevitable cruelty and stupidity. It's inevitable. I mean, the only people who are surprised and confused by the inevitable stupidity and cruelty that has once again resurfaced in the world are people who don't read Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers and the prophets and the New Testament and our brothers and sisters who study the Quran, anyone who studies wisdom literature, especially children of Abraham, the children of the book. Look, friends, if you're surprised by sin, especially surprised by cruelty, it's because you lack humility, frankly. Now, nobody's humble. <laughs> Those are my own words. But what I mean by that statement is you're not really aware of the fact that you're capable of everything that's happening. Because that's what Deuteronomy teaches you. Deuteronomy teaches you that you are the unclean. You are capable of committing all of the horrors that are being committed because that's what we do as human beings. We, as I said recently in a podcast title, we are the evil in the land. What are you purging the land of in Deuteronomy? That's the question that's posed. It's like that famous, I've said this for years in Bible study. I know no one hears because so few even attend Bible study in the first place, which is why the podcast for me is a relief for my conscience, at least, that I'm doing my duty towards God, 
you know, all these American kids who become Muslim like to talk about reversion to Islam. You don't revert to Islam. Paul says, stay as you are. You don't convert to anything. You belong to God. You revert to God in all things. There is no conversion to anything. I am content always just to preach the gospel because I answer to the Lord Jesus Christ and through him to his Father. I don't care if people attend Bible study. I don't care about growth or numbers. And this is what I mean when I say that the podcast for me is a blessing and a grace. Because I teach. That is my duty toward God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And I've said it in Bible study for decades. That Deuteronomy is like that old episode of the Twilight Zone where a man comes to your house to announce to you that you have won, I don't know, it was an, a large amount, like a million dollars. All you have to do is press this red button on this box and somebody else that you don't know will die. All you have to do is press this red button. There's a beautiful metaphor for war, the military industrial complex, for the acquisition of wealth at the expense of your neighbor, but especially in war, because somebody else always dies to put bread on your table, to put money in your pocket, to provide comfort for your household, security for your tribe. That is the human system. That is how it has always worked. That is what Deuteronomy is mocking. Purge the land, the blessing and the curse, security for you. And in the opening of Deuteronomy, you are presented with the same proposition. That is the Pauline teaching of grace. Here, here's an opportunity. You see these people here? I'm going to wipe them out so that you can be here. But just as I'm taking them out and putting you in, I can take you out too. So in this... Twilight Zone episode, this couple takes the box and they debate and they argue and they debate and they argue. One of them was greedier than the other. It puts all kinds of strain on their relationship. They took it overnight. And in the end, they convinced each other. It was a bit of an Adam and Eve paradigm, the forbidden fruit, so to speak. They debated and they decided to press the button. So the guy came back to the house the next day, gave them the money and took the box back. And they asked, what are you going to do with the box? And he said, I'm going to go to someone you don't know and present it to them. And the language he used made it very clear that he was going to make the same proposition to someone else they don't know, which implied <laughs> that if the next, <laughs> if the next couple were to press the button, they would be murdered, which was the judgment of the Mashal in that Twilight Zone episode. It was quite beautiful quite powerful. It's an American classic. And it encapsulates the lesson of Deuteronomy in the opening chapter of the text, which is the lesson of the Pauline household of faith. God put you in and he can take you out. You are here on sheer grace. The land is not a possession as your colonial Bibles continually lie to you. The land is a gift. It is a natan. It is granted as a gift. You don't possess it. Father Paul goes to great lengths in the rise of scripture and decoding Genesis to explain the technicality of the terminology and the racism of the translations. But more importantly, those who come from the side lazily and try to snatch sheep out of God's fold with cheap scholarship, lazy scholarship, ideological scholarship, scholarship influenced by political fads, whispering lies that Deuteronomy isn't really scripture, 
telling lies to our people, are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. And this is the unforgivable sin in Scripture. Likewise, those who use Deuteronomy in order to justify the shedding of innocent blood, which is forbidden in the text of Deuteronomy, which is what's happening right now, which happens over and over and over again, as I illustrated in the opening monologue, which is happening now and which will continue to happen in the future because that is the way of human beings. And that is why Deuteronomy was written, divinely inscribed by the finger of the Most High God. Those who co-opt and use and usurp the divinely inscribed letters for an evil purpose are committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You are willfully and knowingly lying in the name of God to serve a human purpose. That's not acceptable. It's condemned and condemnable. It is willful ignorance to serve a human agenda. It's unforgivable because it's willful. It's willful laziness. It's willful cruelty. Why do people not want to deal with the text of Deuteronomy? Because its pass of entry is the teaching of St. Silouan of Athos. You must keep your mind in hell, but not lose hope. You must keep your mind in hell. That is the passive entry of all those who submit to Scripture. Because in order to do that, you have to accept that you are as bad as the worst villains of history. You are capable of all the evil that is being committed before your eyes. You can't go to a DNC convention and clap and cheer for all your highfalutin values when you know that you are the evil. But when you know that you are the evil and that the worst horrors of the Holocaust, the worst horrors of the genocide, the worst horrors that you can think up in your colonial nightmares, those horrors are in you. You're capable of those things. Once you understand that, and people who've worked in government, like the writers of scripture, they know it. And that's why they made a decision to turn their back on the earthly king and submit to the true king who has no depiction, who has no temple, who has no city, who has no standing army. And not to write the history of earthly kings in order to justify earthly agendas, but to write the anti-history of the heavenly kingdom, which is to come. The king of Daniel the prophet, which is the kingdom to end all kingdoms, which shall not end. To him be the glory. That is the proposition of scripture. That is the kingdom to which the law of Deuteronomy pertains. And whatever cruelty we can think up against our brothers and sisters, the God of scripture will always outdo us in the hope of his reign, but he outdoes us in literature, not in history. But when we see cruelty in history, our reference point must be reframed so that we are not overrun with the terror of the monsters that we bring forth, but we are given hope because we realize that there is one who is mightier than them, who has things under control. He is our reference point. Scripture is a different frame of mind. It is a different reference. As I heard someone say recently, it is a constant, constant reminder that we must worship no one, that we must worship nothing but him. Every time you see a bomb go off, it's an invitation to worship someone other than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. This teaching about generosity, about the one who gives us the gift of the land, about the one who provides everything, about accepting that he is the source of all grace. He gives and he takes away. It's the blessing and the curse in Deuteronomy. And this verb, which is also a noun, it can mean gift, 
and it can mean give, Nathan, is actually used in verse 38 in Luke. It appears repeatedly in Deuteronomy. It appears first in Genesis. It's linked to this verb in Greek that appears three times in verse 38 of Luke. Didote, give, and it will be given. It's the same verb again when it says given. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. This discussion of pouring out, which again is the same verb that appears in Genesis, Deuteronomy, and elsewhere. It's about giving. The English is so deceptive because when you hear pouring, you naturally think, I mean, it could refer to grain, but your initial reaction without knowing the context and without being familiar with the original Greek is to think of pouring out a drink, but it's referring to grain in a specific process in which grain would be pressed down and shaken together to remove any empty spaces. And it makes sense, right? They would pour the grain down to remove empty spaces and then add more until it overflowed. And this would be to make sure that, you know, you had the maximum amount of grain so that the buyer wasn't cheated when they would receive their measure, their single measure. So it's about being generous and about being fair. That's what we're talking about. And it pertains to the bounty of the land. Now, hearing Luke, hearing the text of Luke, it harkens back again to the land, to the field, to Jesus and the provision of the shepherd with his disciples when he was providing them the best part, the fatty part of the grain. All of this is connected. It flows beautifully. But the one who provides the gift, the one who grants the gift, is the father of Jesus. It's not Jesus. Jesus, you could say, is his representative in the marketplace. If we were to follow the line of this particular metaphor, where you're measuring out the grant, you're pouring it out, if we go with the translation, which again is a little bit confusing in English. So in this example, we're talking about grain, we're talking about the fruit of the land, we're talking about generosity, but it's the provision of God's grant, God's gift. Always it goes back to the source. And one of the reasons that this story of Amlak, the story of Deuteronomy, and the metaphor, the mashal of the Torah has been so twisted by the enemies of God. And I'm not using this language in some kind of a religious ideological debate between religious groups or sects or tribes. This is not about Jews versus Christians or Jews versus Muslims or Muslims versus Christians. All of that is nonsense. What's happening now is not a religious war. Those who have committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit view it through that lens. Whether they be secular people who have co-opted that framework or they are fanatics who have co-opted that framework, all of that is nonsense. Because those who submit to God, whatever they are and whoever they are, as Paul says, those who submit to God know that what's happening is evil. Whatever they believe is irrelevant. Whatever their identity is makes no matter. Those who know that what's happening now is evil belong to God. Let's be clear on that point. Those who have twisted Deuteronomy in order to justify cruelty do not belong to God. Those who are using it to work against the commandments of God knowingly are committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because you are making these precious holy words which come from the mouth of God unhearable. That's the worst possible sin you could commit because what else do we have? What else do we have except the precious words of the Almighty? 
This was the point that Reverend Munder Ishaq was making when he was in the U.S. He was trying to explain that they are weaponizing the Bible. That is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You are lying about God knowingly. So once again, let's stay focused on the text and submit to the one God. The land is a gift, the grain is a gift, and you have received it through the generosity and kindness of the one in Deuteronomy who offers the blessing and the curse. He grants both. That's what Paul is telling you in Galatians. That is the teaching of Jesus Christ. Oh, but the New Testament is different only if you're not hearing it. That is a cheap, lazy theology that came out of Europe that was embraced by everyone because it's really good for parish growth. It's good for the bank account. The God of the New Testament is so nice, he doesn't expect anything of you except to come to church and feel good about yourself. That's modern Christian theology, and it's a big joke. The result is a bunch of people who can't believe that there are wars. We're so shocked that there are wars. All we want to do is go to church and feel good about ourselves and have money in our account and have a nice job. Why are these people in the Middle East so upset? Good luck with that way of thinking, people. Just good luck with that way of thinking. So the first term, again, is this term grant. And I mentioned it occurs three times. The triliteral root, as I said, is nun, tav, nun. It appears all over the place. Right away in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, then God said, behold, I have given, natati, you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. Now, according to the mentality of colonial corporatism, you can patent those seeds, but not according to Genesis. Now, according to those who commit blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, well, is Genesis really the word of God? It's not historical. It's a fragment text. Yeah, whatever. Because I will cling to Genesis and carry it with me, bury it with me. If I could eat Genesis, I would. In fact, when I take communion, I am eating Genesis because Genesis are the words of God. Are you kidding me, people? Are you kidding me? This is our hope and our shield and our buckler and our protection against the present hell that we are surrounded by, the hell of ignorance and darkness and cruelty. This is our hope. Behold, I have given Natati. Monsanto didn't give the seeds that feed us. God in heaven gave us these seeds. Are you people nuts? Well, but uh, let's have a debate about evolution versus creationism. No, that's a dumb debate. This isn't about historicity. This is literature. Just forget the neurotic institutional insecurity that crept up after the Enlightenment, where everybody had to prove and argue and try to figure out that's not what's going on here. Nobody here in this text is that stupid. The people who wrote this text aren't concerned with science or history. They're concerned with our cruelty and our arrogance. It's literature. It's a mashal. It is wisdom literature given to protect us from the present stupidity. Because we really believe that we have a right to patent our seeds. We really believe that we own our houses. We really believe that we earn our salaries. We really believe that we can possess the land. And Deuteronomy is a warning that the land doesn't belong to you. And look what's happening because we're that stupid. We really believe that we built our churches. It's all the same sin. That's the functionality 
of Natan. It's such an important word. Vilomi. It is granted. And it is granted with such generosity. God is so generous. Someone, when they're not in their right mind, says, I didn't ask to be born. Someone in their right mind understands that that's the point. Life is this beautiful gift. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, o metro metrite, so beautiful in Greek, it will be measured to you in return. This is, on the one hand, so graceful and beautiful and eloquent in its language in Greek. And at the same time, it's ominous. That's why, once again, I love that example from the Twilight Zone. It's an offer that's presented, an offer that you actually could refuse in the case of the Twilight Zone example. And it's appealing, but it's also a sword of Damocles. You know, something is being given to you. It's graceful. It's generous. It's fair, beyond fair. It's bountiful. You better be generous also and stop complaining, stop whining, stop grumbling like the gangrene who complained about Jesus, who was living this commandment out in his generosity with the father's grain. Remember, the fat of the land didn't belong to Jesus, which is why he was sharing it with others. You have to do the same. When Jesus entered the field in the spirit of Deuteronomy, he didn't say, this is my land. He didn't. He shared what he found with those around him. And now Luke is saying, that's how you have to conduct yourself. That is the teaching of the Torah. So let's talk a little bit about this word, metron. The triliteral in Hebrew is mim, dalet, dalet. It has to do with measurement. So you see how scripture co-opts capitalism. It co-opts the language of the market, which even though scripture wasn't written for the modern West, it certainly wasn't written for Americans, we should be uncomfortable when we hear this because we use measurement to control and to acquire. We draw lines, we try to acquire and take and gain, and scripture is flipping the script, so to speak, and saying that you should use measurement in order to make sure that you are not only fair, but you go beyond fairness to stretch out and to pour out and to share. I'm using the English now. You pour it out, you share. And that's how it functions in its itinerary in the biblical text. Meme, valet, valet. Measuring out. It denotes measures or portions. Okay, there's a corresponding root in Arabic. It's the exact same function in this case the same consonants. And it has to do in Arabic, and this really teases out this notion of generosity. And in Arabic, interestingly, it's linked to writing. It relates to the idea of extension, of lengthening or spreading. The word in Arabic is madda, which means to extend or to stretch out. And it also can mean amount. And in one particular use, midad refers to ink or to the extension of writing, which is beautiful because in the tradition of Arabic literature, obviously with respect both to poetry and later to the Quran, it's the generosity of wisdom, which is stretched out on the scroll. But this is the Semitic tradition. It's the genius of writing, which is why this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is to undermine the letters divinely inscribed, the words from God's lips, which are written in the scroll of God. This is the legacy of Western scholarship. Well, I'm not sure which texts are from God and which are not. Let me see, how can I decide? What is the conclusion of Western scholarship? I will decide what is God's word and what is not God's word. Which means what? Which means what? Who is God? The Western scholar who decides this is scripture and this is not scripture. 
Are you kidding me, people? What does that sound like? I, the Westerner, will decide which countries are which countries in the Middle East and in Africa and in Latin America. Why? Because I'm God. There is no God but the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the God of the Torah and the God of the New Testament. Just forget, just forget these silly debates. Just forget all the silly debates. All these people who are talking about, well, I think this and I think that, are talking about their thoughts. If someone is not pointing to a text and talking about lexicography, they are giving you vain thoughts. They don't know what they're talking about because human beings do not know what they're talking about when it comes to God's thoughts, because our thoughts are not his thoughts. And I would like to give you an example from Leviticus. You shall do no wrong in judgment, in measurement of weight or capacity. This is what Luke is telling you. Do not sin against your brother because that sin will be weighed against you in the judgment. So the gratia of God's household, just like the gratia that God shows you in Deuteronomy is to be held against you. It's the blessing and the curse. So each time in Deuteronomy, <laughs> Each time you exterminate the other, it is being recorded. It's a marker against you. That's how it works. It's literature, friends. It's literature. And you have to understand the historical context, the setting in which the literature is presented, and you have to understand that it's historical fiction there is a setting, there is an historical reference. You know, I try to give examples to people, but people have different movies, different books that they read, they have different frames of reference. So it's hard to find frames of reference that work when you have such an array of students. So I ask you, I challenge you as podcast listeners, think of a movie or a book that you've read that you've appreciated the meaning of the story in which there was some horror committed in the book or in the movie. You know from the literature that you consume outside the Bible that the authors will employ literary devices that we all find horrifying and disgusting, but we understand that it's a literary mechanism and we understand the author is saying something. The fact that there is some violence in literature or some act of horror in literature does not constitute an endorsement of that violence or that horror. And it is incumbent upon those who are knowledgeable to teach. That is the only way forward. And it is incumbent upon those who have not actually taken the time to hear the text in the original language to be honest with themselves and stop opining about it. What amazes me about scripture is that people who don't know what they're talking about feel justified in opining about the text. I will never understand this. I mean, I do understand that it's human nature. I mean, people love to blab. But this is the divine text. Those who actually claim to worship the God of Abraham. I mean, for heaven's sake, have some fear in you because we will be held to account for everything we say. This is the divinely inscribed text. These are the words of God. To him be the glory, the dominion, and the majesty, always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Yalla. Bye. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.